President Trump today defended his daughter Ivanka Trump after the Washington Post reported that she repeatedly used her personal email to conduct government business while serving in the White House throughout 2017. Just so you understand, early on, and for a little period of time, Ivanka did some emails. Uh, they weren't classified like Hillary Clinton. They weren't deleted like Hillary Clinton, who deleted 33. She wasn't hiring. She wasn't doing anything to hide her emails. You're talking about a whole different, you're talking about all fake news. So what Ivanka did, it's all in the presidential records. Everything is there. There was no deletion, there was no nothing. What it is, is a false story. Hillary Clinton deleted 33,000 emails. She had a server in the basement. That's the real story. The Washington Post revealed last night that when Ivanka Trump was questioned about her use of a personal email account, quote, she said she was not familiar with some details of the rules, according to people with knowledge of her reaction. Yet, the risk for Trump is that her actions may have violated the Presidential Records Act, which mandates the preservation of all White House communications. This comes after Politico revealed last year that Jared Kushner had also used a personal email account to conduct government business as well. According to a review conducted by Ivanka Trump's attorneys, they found that, quote, fewer than 100 emails related to official business and fewer than 1,000 that pertain to scheduling and travel uh, are involved. Joining me now is Mika Oyang, Vice President for the National Security Program at Third Way. And Brett Stevens is a columnist uh, for the New York Times. And Mika, let me just start with you. You heard the president there who made quite an issue in the 2016 campaign of Hillary Clinton and the issue of emails, trying to say there is no parallel there at all between Hillary Clinton and Ivanka. What do you make of his attempt to draw distinctions there? Look, he's trying to protect his daughter, and we understand that, but we don't, it's not the same circumstance, and we don't know whether or not all those emails are, in fact, unclassified. We don't know whether or not they all went into the presidential records as they're supposed to. And so I think it's fair that people ask for some oversight about whether or not his statements are, in fact, true. But more importantly, this is an example of the lax adherence to security rules by the Trump family. And we saw this with the president and his use of his personal iPhone, the ways that he continues to use Twitter, the ways he's ha talked about classified information in public settings. They just don't appreciate how serious these concerns are. Yeah, and I think, Brett, that's the thing that kind of jumps out at me when I saw the headline read the story yesterday. The, the emphasis that Trump placed on the issue of email with Hillary Clinton in 2016. I know he's trying to draw all these distinctions here, and we will see as we learn more about Ivanka exactly how analogous the situations are. But the fact that this was even an open issue, the possibility of somebody like Ivanka Trump using a personal email address for government business for months, apparently, into the Trump administration after making that such a point of emphasis in the campaign. Well, I think we have to lock Ivanka Trump up. That's the only answer here. No, I mean, I, I say that in, in, in jest, obviously. It tells you that maybe Ivanka Trump was asleep during her father's entire campaign or never believed that he was going to win because what, what's really incredible about this story isn't what sounds to me like something like a misdemeanor offense. It's that her father, having made this the central or a central issue of his campaign for president, that she should not have been absolutely scrupulous and on top of the rules from the, the get-go. And of course, the second issue is this is what happens when you hire your daughter, you hire your relatives for, for important government positions. They don't know what the rules are. That's why you should hire nepotistically as a matter of, pra of, of good practice in government. You know, also, people say the issue with nepotism is when you get in a situation like this, you maybe are more prone to defend the relative in a public setting because they are your relative, after all. Meanwhile, President Trump today is again deflecting blame from Saudi Arabia, even though the CIA has reportedly <laughs> concluded with high confidence that Saudi Crown the Saudi, Saudi Crown Prince ordered the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was a legal U.S. resident. In a press release which contained a total of six exclamation points, Trump said today that, quote, it could very well be that the Crown Prince had knowledge of this tragic event. Maybe he did, and maybe he didn't. The president also repeated unsubstantiated Saudi government smears about Khashoggi, saying, quote, representatives of Saudi Arabia say that Jamal Khashoggi was, quote, an enemy of the state and a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Here's how Trump explained why he sided with the Saudi government over his own intelligence community. Because it's America first for me. It's all about America first. We're not going to give up hundreds of billions of dollars in orders 
and let Russia, China, and everybody else have them. Saudi Arabia, uh, if we broke with them, I think your oil prices would go through the roof. I've kept them down. They've helped me keep them down. It's a very simple equation for me. I'm about make America great again, and I'm about America first. What do you make of that? Uh, the decision in the way he's framing it. Well, I mean, it's ugly on so many levels. First of all, this is a make Saudi Arabia first uh, type of foreign, of foreign policy. I mean, we're the superpower. Saudi Arabia is our client. We're also the world's number one energy producer. So the suggestion that Saudi Arabia has us over, over the proverbial barrel when it comes to energy simply is, is a view out of the 1970s or, or, or another decade. But the, what was really ugly about the statement was the suggestion that Saudi Arabia or MBS's uh, ordering the gruesome murder of a Washington Post columnist was somehow an acceptable price given what I think he pointed out, $450 billion. That's his claim. I don't think it's anywhere near uh, that much in money coming uh, into uh, the United States. And it's precisely that kind of interest-based foreign uh, policy which, which gets us uh, into trouble. Gets us into trouble not least for the people in the Middle East who look to American values when it comes to democracy, individual rights, respect for a free press, respect for minorities, respect for dissidents. Those are the reasons they look to us as a, as a lodestar. We are now adopting what amounts to a purely uh, a mercantilist uh, foreign policy that might, might have a place in, in Persian Gulf politics, shouldn't have a place in American politics. Mika Oyang, if, you, if you've been advising the president uh, on how to handle this and in what to say today, what, to, what posture to take, what would you have told him? Look, I don't think that he can continue to defend Saudi Arabia the way that he has. It's very clear that you have to call your friends to account. Even when, especially when they are doing terrible things. And we all agree, even the president will acknowledge that the killing of Jamal Khashoggi is, is an atrocity. And that he will not believe his own intelligence agencies when they go out there and they find the truth for him, sometimes at great risk themselves. And he's making foreign policy based on what he believes, not what is true. That's very dangerous for America and America's actions in the region when he's also mischaracterizing the civil war in Yemen and Saudi Arabia's involvement in it, when he's mischaracterizing the size of these arms deals, the president is not actually leveling with the American people about what's really at stake here. All right, Mika Oyang, Brett Stevens, thank you both for being with us. And up next, with most of the provisional and absentee ballots counted in the final midterm race.